Hey, who remembers the infamous games? They're pretty good. No one seems to talk enough about them, which is a shame really, because they're fantastic games. They're fast, full of verticality, and they give you so many options to smoke someone in the face and dash in, break their skull, and finish it by dropping them like a comet if you please. They're great! The past video was rather long. I wanted to make something more bite-sized for this one. Might as well, because it's on a slightly more inconclusive topic. As we went over in the last video, all stories have themes and the infamous games are no exception. Infamous Second Son touched on way on liberty versus security, as was eloquently elaborated upon by Nate Fox. <laughs> infamous 2 had these themes of salvation and redemption running through it. A guy like that? He's out to save the world in some grand old testament kind of way. An infamous one was about seeing how utterly forgettable a game can be. Okay, I'll come clean. It's been like seven years since I played it. I've seen what I needed to see to make this video. Please don't make me go back to infamous one. Please. Alright, each of these games has a defined theme, and it's not off the table that I'll make a video about them individually later on. I'm particularly keen on making one about Infamous 2 at the very least. But today, I'd like to talk about certain elements that have consistently shown up across the series. Not the loudly announced marketing bullet points like superpowers, moral choices or the lack of a title screen. It's so weird! but thematic undercurrents that run throughout the whole series and have become progressively more prominent. They may signal towards a theme the team at Sucker Punch has been trying to develop or perhaps it's just part of the series' personality. Regardless, I believe it becomes increasingly apparent with each game that Infamous as a series is aggressively modern, urban and a lower class. In other words, it's punk as fuck. First, let us briefly summarize the premise of the main games in the series, to get a sense of where this argument is coming from. Infamous 1 begins after a cataclysm levels five full blocks of the New York standing du jour, Empire City. The city is being closed down after the protagonist Cole McGrath found himself at the center of the explosion. He's begun to develop electric superpowers and constructed some bare bones accommodations in a city rooftop. The first mission is based around relief efforts that have recently been delivered via airdrop. Infamous 2 sees you fleeing Empire City to New Marais, a fictionalized version of New Orleans after, well, unfortunate events. Yep, right here, man. Cole obtains the mean to escape through a government agent and eventually visits a recreation of the flooded areas of town. In Infamous Second Son, Delson Rose tribe is injured by the leader of a paramilitary force in an attempt to uncover him as superhuman. He then pursues them to Seattle, where he must weaken their grasp on the city before he can storm their base of operations. So let's take this in parts, kind of two parts but not really. To begin we have to define the distinction between these two similarly sounding points, urbanity and modernity. While superficially they can blend together, urbanization has actually been around for quite a long time, but what's modern is ever changing with the passage of time. The argument could actually be made that, in the countries where most of us watching this live, the quintessentially modern setting is not the herb, but the suburb. Yet Infamous makes a point to set itself in fictionalized versions of America's most populous cities. Granted, a lot of this is for gameplay reasons. But it's not like this kind of setting has kept other games in the past from including nearby communities that don't belong to the urban area per se. And when they did add less urban environments, they made a point of making the character from them all tribal and quite culturally different from the rest of the cast. Okay, so we've established how infamous is set in a city. Big discovery there, you say. But there's also the fact of how these games couldn't take place outside of a city. Not only by gameplay convenience and level design, but by the nature of the story itself. Cole depends on the electrical grid to keep himself powered and compares the feeling of being in an area with little power to that of thirst. Man, brain feels like it's in a vice. Your body must be reacting to the absence of electricity. Even a well-developed rural area could not provide him with enough power to keep him replenished. 
This goes further in Second Sun, where Deltum can manipulate smoke, neon, video, and concrete, all being absorbed from wherever they may be found. With very good luck, an industrial rural area could provide them with two of these consistently and a smattering of the other two at best. This is quite a contrast from the archetypal superhero. While Superman, Batman, Iron Man and Spider-Man all make most of their appearances exclusively in the city, there's no real reason why their abilities couldn't perform just as well in small isolated communities. Some games have even come up with a way for Spider-Man to retain this mobility in mostly flat terrain. Despite many arguing, this method of transport could only work in a skyline and similar to New York's. Granted, jumping into the air and pulling himself is a bit inelegant, but it still transports him several meters per second at speeds no person could move. These are all elements that are only allowed to exist in such high quantities and availabilities in our highly industrialized modern world. But there's a bit more to it than that. There's the obvious fact that the prevalence of neon signs and video screens is a completely modern cultural artifact for starters. But also the way both main characters in the series get around is via a mix of parkour and the mobility options provided by their superpowers. The former being a discipline that it's already somewhat novel but didn't become popular until incredibly recently. Cole even wears toad shoes specifically designed for it, which are a very new thing still. Additionally, in Second Son, Delsim's hobby is to do graffiti, which is by no means a new pastime. But his specific way of doing it is directly inspired by the modern sensation Banksy. It is in examples like these that you see extremely modern culture informing the very essence of gameplay in the series. Let's move on to the point I foresee being the most disagreeable lower class. After the explosion in Infamous 1, basically all modern accommodations become incredibly scarce. Everyone is suddenly on what would have been the lower class previous to the event, and one could make the argument that Cole and his friends are actually better off than most of the people in town. That is until it is revealed that he's always been a bit of an awkward fit for his community, messing with cops for fun, quitting school and taking up a job as a courier, much to his parents' chagrin. It gets to the point where his parents lie about his occupation because he's fallen under their expectations for him. Your mother is ashamed. She lies, tells people you're a teacher. No one respects a bike messenger. In Infamous 2, however, Cole is much more decidedly cast as a lower class character. First of all, he's made to sound, look and act fairly younger than in the previous game, and the younger a person is in their mid-twenties, the less money and social clout they're expected to have. More emphasis is drawn to his illegal activities, it is the first thing mentioned about him once you hit town in fact. The city's been overrun by a sort of Puritan militia described in the game as rednecks hunting for deviants, presumably of the moral type of which Cole is portrayed as one, implying further that he's an outcast from mainstream traditional society. At the time of Infamous 2, Numeria is messed up, but it is no empire city. In vast swaths of town, the power supply remains intact, which means life continues on about as normally as it could in a situation like this. Despite that, Cole and Zeke continue to live in the most makeshift of rooftop squads, even though they now count with the aid of a government agent. They're even happier about their rough accommodations this second time around. Coming from the second son, we aren't given that much information about Delson's home or personal life. We know his brother is the pride of his community and the sheriff. Implying reaching a position like that is quite remarkable for them, but that's not much to go on. Our protagonist is once again a troublemaker who doesn't get along with the authorities, coding him as lower class all anew. Since, you know, in real life, police and the lower classes of any community tend to be more... adversarial. Oh yeah, he's also an ethnic minority, so there's that as well. It doesn't end at Delson, however. 
With the ensemble of allies in Second Son also consisting of a girl who ran away from home, then fell into a drug habit and is currently squatting an abandoned building, and a kid with crippling social anxiety also squatting somewhere in town. So we have minorities, drug users, and the mentally ill. Plus, they're all members of a prosecuted people, since all superhumans are assumed terrorists and all threats to public safety, basically making a rainbow coalition of the underclasses of Seattle. You know, if the rainbow were composed of black, orange, neon pink and electric blue. So, what's my point? Am I implying that Infamous is some kind of work based around modern concepts of class? Not really. This time, there is no point per se. Whilst it is fairly evident that these motifs are in every game, they are continuously overshadowed by the more common superhero storylines and the themes that come with each one of them. Atonement, civil liberties, etc. The best guess I can posit forward as to why they keep growing in prominence is that it could be a concept they've been aiming to tackle with the series since early development that they keep hinting towards. Or perhaps it's just an aesthetic that they enjoy portraying. Or it may just be the lens through which the writing staff views the world. At the very least, I think this video has been a good way of pointing out that our series identity is composed of far more than the usual back-of-the-box bullet points, since these aspects of it are part of what makes Infamous feel very distinct from other superhero stories out there that could very well sell their games using the same taglines. I've been Walker, and thank you for listening.